And our first speaker is a senior scientist at 21st Century Medicine, a company in Southern California developing technology for preserving transplantable organs. He holds a PhD in physics from the University of Manitoba, where he studied radiation oncology and magnetic resonance uh, imaging, specializing in the study of the human brain function uh, at the National Research Council of Canada. He left the field of medical physics in 1997 to work in the field of cryobiology. He is a pioneer in the field of vitrification, relatively new approach for preserving tissue at low temperatures without freezing. Here is Dr. Brian Wolk. Good afternoon. Let me begin by, uh, first of all, telling you what I'm not going to talk about today. Um, in talking about suspended animation, I'm not going to talk about hibernation. I'm not going to talk about frozen frogs and turtles that aren't really frozen. Or suspended animation, as the term is used in medicine today, which refers to clinical hypothermia. What I'm going to talk about is uh, true long-term suspended animation, uh, sometimes called biostasis, which is the complete stoppage of life processes for indefinite periods of time years, decades, uh, theoretically even centuries. Now, most people know that this can already be done for single cells. Uh, techniques for reversibly freezing single cells uh, in liquid nitrogen were first developed more than 50 years ago. But if we can <laughs> freeze single cells, uh, you know, uh, why can't we also have suspended animation, as it were, of, of whole human beings? Part of the problem is that living things are made of water. And water, when it's uh, cooled, has an unfortunate tendency to crystallize into ice. And when water freezes into ice, it freezes as a pure substance, which means um, the process of freezing excludes other uh, materials that are dissolved in the water, uh, such as uh, salts and, and biomolecules, and squishes them into uh, small spaces outside of the ice crystals. On a cellular level, the process looks something like this, that when ice forms, it first forms uh, between cells, and it uh, dehydrates cells, shrinking them into uh, spaces between the ice crystals until as you continue lowering the temperatures, the cells are fatally dehydrated and squashed in these tiny pockets in between the ice crystals. And Note that this is the exact opposite of the popular conception of how freezing damages cells. Most people think that um, water freezes inside cells and bursts them, but actually um, in slowly cooled tissue, the exact opposite happens. Uh, cells are squashed from the outside, not burst from the inside. This damage can be uh, reduced using cryoprotectants such as glycerol or DMSO, and these materials, these uh, solutes work by depressing the freezing point of water as it's cooled. So if, for example, you cool salt water, the type of water we find in tissue, without any cryoprotectant, it very quickly forms a large volume of ice and squashes um, the remaining water into a small, highly concentrated salt solution. Whereas if you add just a little bit of cryoprotectant, you find as you lower the temperature that the amount of ice it forms is limited and there's a larger unfrozen volume of water remaining. And it's within that larger unfrozen uh, volume that cells are able to survive so that when you get to liquid nitrogen temperature instead of having that you have something more like that where the cells are able to um, retain their viability inside those um, small and frozen pockets. In the real life the process looks something like this. These are vials filled with various concentrations of glycerol ranging from 50 to 58 percent. I'm going to take these vials and lower them down into a dewer containing liquid nitrogen and I'm going to hold them just above the surface of liquid nitrogen for 15 minutes. I'm then going to lift the vials out and show them to you. The one with 50 percent glycerol is filled with millions of tiny ice crystals. So is the one with 52 percent glycerol. At 54 percent you can see the ice starting to clear. With 56% glycerol, there's very little ice remaining in the solution. And finally, at 58%, um, there's no ice uh, in the volume of that solution. And this is really remarkable because when this photograph is taken, this vial is at a temperature of minus 110 degrees Celsius. And yet, there's no ice. What, what, if it's not ice, what, what is in there exactly? Well, 
technically what's in there is a glass. It's a liquid that has become so thick that it's become uh, solid and we call this process vitrification. And uh, vitrification was first suggested as a completely new approach to cryopreserving living materials by my colleague Dr. Gregory Fay back in uh, 1984. And the basic idea is that instead of with freezing where we start off with a little bit of cryoprotectant and we allow cells to survive in these tiny unfrozen pockets made possible by the cryoprotectant with vitrification we start with a large amount of cryoprotectant right up front and uh, we start with so much cryoprotectant that ice formation is inhibited at all temperatures as you cool. So instead of freezing occurring, the liquid solution just becomes thicker and thicker like syrup and then finally becomes so viscous that at a temperature called the glass transition temperature, which is usually around minus 120 degrees Celsius, the liquid becomes a solid, an unstructured glass-like solid. So on a molecular level, the process looks something like this. Imagine you have this solution of water molecules with these little red things here, ions dissolved in, in the water like a, as in a salt water solution. And these yellow molecules are a cryoprotectant in a vitrification solution. As you cool, the uh, cryoprotectant molecules prevent the water from organizing into uh, ice crystals so that even when you get all the way down to liquid nitrogen temperature, the molecular, the structure of the liquid on a molecular level looks just like it does as a normal undisturbed liquid. The only difference is, is you're now so cold that movement or diffusion of the molecules is now inhibited and all they can do is just vibrate a little bit in place. But chemistry has stopped, biological time has stopped. On a tissue level, it looks something like this. You start off with your tissue, you add your cryoprotectant to it, you cool, and again, all the way down to liquid nitrogen temperature, and there's no structural damage because there's no ice in there. Um, everything has just stopped. Uh, it, these are actual um, electron micrographs of brain tissue after rewarming uh, from minus 80 degrees Celsius. The tissue sample on the left was protected with a glycerol solution that permitted some freezing to occur. And you can see these large gaps here and here, which are areas where ice formed. Uh, whereas the tissue on the right was protected with a vitrification solution and there's uh, no ice damage at all in that slice. On an organ level, vitrification looks like this. These are two kidneys suspended in a, in a vitrification solution at a temperature of minus 140 degrees Celsius. The kidney on the left was untreated and it's turned essentially into a big snowball, um, irreversibly damaged by all the ice it formed, whereas the kidney on the right was treated internally with the vitrification solution before cooling and um, it looks basically the same as it as it looked uh, before deep cooling started. Um, it suffered no structural damage from ice and biological time has stopped at, 